How's everybody doing? The guy who likes these candles is out of town. I'll be down in a minute. So who was here to hear Johnny preach last week? I was. I watched it um, live on Facebook and um, it's just very compelling. Uh, Sorry, that song made me uh, tear up a little bit. I'm sorry about that. But uh, when I see, uh, I don't know, when I see a testimony like John's, I'll just, I'll just move on. We've been, uh, we've been doing this series, and I, I don't know, I just kind of can't get away from it because uh, just so many things about love, so many facets about love. Just kind of, when I say, oh, let's just move on, and like, nah, you know what? There's there's a couple more things, you know, that I think maybe I should talk about. Since we're in the summer, we can kind of have some flexibility. You know, this series, I was kind of just grabbed it from Aaron anyway. So, um, you know, the series is called Love, The Most Excellent Way. A couple weeks ago, I said love is a hard thing. I kind of did a little play on words. Is hard is also H-A-R-D. It's a hard thing. Love is a hard thing. It's difficult. And uh, I don't know, this week I was out running, and I, and I just heard this song, I'm the way, I'm the way, I'm the way. It just kind of moved me. I don't know why. I was almost in tears. Just listen to the song, and, uh, and of course, it comes from John fourteen six, which is, "I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life." Jesus is saying, "I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life." And you know, I've heard it many times, and I've preached it, and I've done it in devotionals, and I've sat people down and said, "You know, Jesus is the way." But I don't know why. It just kind of hit me in a new way. And He's not just the way to heaven. He's the way to live. You know, he's the way to do things in life, in this life, and he's the truth. He's not just some, you know, the only Savior. Yeah, he's that. No doubt about that, but he's also the truth. And when you start questioning things, you go back and you say, Jesus, you're, you're the truth. And then when we start struggling with, you know, the things of this life that, that cause decay, uh, you know, he's the life. And life comes out of that, and I just... I just was moved by that. So uh, Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and the light. But as followers, and I'm preaching to followers of Jesus today, and if you're not one of those, I hope you become one. But when we were when we were first moved by the gospel, all of us said, yes, you are the way. Yes, you are the truth. Yes, you're the life, and I will follow. But did we say that? Yeah. I mean, I always leave people like, you know, as much as possible, I'm going to give you my life every day, I'm going to give you life again. You know, I'm just going to just take it away from you, God, and let me disintegrate, if you will, and let you come up out of me. Let me become who you want me to be and nothing else. And so that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. Is he says, listen, I, can, I got the answer to everything, all of it. And you just have to follow. You have to grab on and you have to follow. Adam also agreed to follow. Didn't he? Adam also agreed to follow. I mean, he, he didn't even know his name. God gave him a name. And they told him who he was. You're a man. And they put words in his mouth. And there's just truth everywhere. God's just speaking truth everywhere. Speaking it to Adam. And Adam's speaking it back to God. And it was just amazing. And of course, then, then Eve is created. And God was just blowing Adam's mind with this thing. And then, and then of course, comes this full frontal attack. This full frontal attack that, that Satan had determined from, you know, probably as long as he'd been created and God knew about. And this attack simply comes and it just starts to question God's truth. To question God's word. To question Eve, if you will, but ultimately Adam as well. Does God really say? Does God really love? Does God really know the way, the truth, the life? And it, it goes like this. Genesis 3, 1 through 7. The servant was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat the trees from the fruit of the garden. The woman replied, It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. For God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the servant replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it. And you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. Instant gratification, right? As soon as you eat it. And the woman was convinced. She was deceived. She saw that the tree was beautiful and fruit, 
its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were open, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they both sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Now we know that it wasn't long after that that God is walking in the garden, and Adam is hiding, and Eve is hiding, and God calls out and says, Adam, where are you? And he said, well, I was naked, so I hid. And of course, God says, well, who told you you were naked? Where did that information come from? Because the word never even existed. Have you eaten from the tree that I told you not to eat from? And of course they have. Eve, yes, Eve failed, yes. She failed to follow. She failed to listen to the word and actually do it, right? But Adam failed as well. Adam failed to lead. He was there with her. Sure, she was hanging out of the tree she was supposed to be at. By the way, I learned something new last year. I didn't even know that was God's tree. It wasn't an evil tree. He said, this is my tree. This is my portion. This is my one. Don't touch it. Don't eat from it. It's like a tithe. Oh. And I heard that. I was like, I never know. I never realized that. It's his. Leave it alone. So she thought it would be good. And so she took it. And so, But he was there with her, and he took it. And so both failed to believe God's word. They believe Satan's word over Yahweh's word. They both failed to submit to God's love. They failed to submit to his leading. And both submitted you and me to Satan's dominion on this earth. They failed and they now have us all submitted, which is my key word for the day, to this dominion, which is Satan's, which is on this earth. But now today, here we are. You know how many millennia we don't know from that point but certainly a couple thousand years from the cross. Here we are now in the church of Jesus Christ in the last days on earth. Here we are. And uh, you know, virtually every problem that we have, no, not virtually every problem, every problem that we have started right there in that garden with that you know, suggestion from Satan to not follow. But, but Jesus says this, but the gates of hell will not prevail over my church. The gates of hell would not prevail over my body on earth, my people, my body that comes together as a church. But sometimes it does look like it, doesn't it? Sometimes I know Jesus' words are true, I know they're true, but sometimes it looks like hell is making a hell of a dent in the church of Jesus Christ. And that's personally too. In every one of our lives, I think we know, every once in a while, hell takes a nice chunk out of us and makes us wonder and makes us doubt and makes us you know, deceived. The, the attacks on the church are literally from everywhere. They're from politics. Uh, most of the world now is openly anti-Christian, not just the United States, but around the world. In the end, friends, all of the attacks are from hell. They're the same attack. It's the same adversary. He's got a lot of lieutenants and captains that work for him, demons, and they all go to work, and, and they say, you know, we're going we're gonna to take a dent, and we're going to try to bring this thing down, even though God said it couldn't happen. Um, many claim that the greatest attack on the church today is the homosexual agenda. Uh, this sermon is not about the homosexual agenda. I just want to use it as an example because many claim, look at this, is happening. You know, this homosexual agenda is being forced on the church. And I will, I will admit that having gay pastors and gay priests who, you know, not just, who not just uh, normalize sin but promote sin, and stand up in pulpits and say it's God's word. Did God really say? Yeah, God really said, man and woman together, that's my creation. And then we, we debase our bodies. And the church in lots of places has owned up to it and said, yeah, let's do that. And now if you are anti any of that, you're horrible. You know, you're on the wrong side of the law. You're on the wrong side of, of uh, time. This is a civil rights issue. It's not even close. What it's happening is a sin has become mainstream because that's the way we work because Satan whispers stuff. And so here's what's really happening. You know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's like, it's like a, something over here is trying to get our attention from the real problem. The real problem. I, I asked Siri this week, hey Siri, how many homosexuals in the United States? <laughs> she knows everything. I mean, she does. She doesn't know how to spell word. I mean, you know, sometimes she messes up. But you know what she said? Hey, Jim, 
of Americans are homosexual. Uh, oh, she's right. I'm sure, sure she is. 3.5%. Okay, so we're not talking about a huge percentage. Now, of course, it's being normalized by a lot more people than that, but what I'm trying to say is that the percentage of people who completely disregard the very fibers of the gospel and the very intricate weaving of the word of God into our lives, the actual scriptures, the, the, the percentage of people who have discounted that is a whole lot higher, 3.5%. And you know what it is? It's actually in the church. It's you and me. We often discount the very fibers that create the cloth which becomes the church because we don't like it. We don't like what Jesus said. And so we move on from it. Have you ever met a Christian that followed Jesus 24-7, 365? No, of course not. Of course not. Even though we say we will. You're the way. You're the truth. You're the life. I'm there. I'm with you. 24. I'm hanging on to you, Jesus. We're like, no, we're not. Because as soon as somebody says, oh, well, that's stupid. We're like, oh, maybe it's stupid. And we wander away. Um, I think that, that there's a lot of unyielding Christians. You ever met an unyielding Christian? Somebody's just, err, you mean, nasty. There's a lot more than 3.5%, I would say. <laughs> right? So the homosexual problem in the beginning would be the real problem. And the attack on the church is, is really kind of openly aggressive, I think, from the Trinity of us. But why would I say that? Well, because we submit to agendas that are not God's, and yet refuse to take on His agenda. That is actually a much larger attack than some of the other ones that are out there. And listen, I'm all pro-life. I think we should love people regardless of their sexual orientation. What I'm saying is that what we do a lot of times is because we just want, maybe we don't want to upset the apple cart. No, you know, just let everybody live. And, you know, I'm all about, you know, letting people live their lives. But when it comes to the church, we're not supposed to be doing that. We're supposed to be doing what Jesus says. And, and like Eve, I think maybe sometimes we don't take time to actually analyze stuff. Did God really say, yes, he really said. Okay, well then let's do that. But that's not what we do. We actually listen and we're deceived, and so we don't follow. Or maybe we don't care. No, maybe we don't care. Some of us just don't care. And, and that's, that's super sad. Because when you think of the cross, and when you think of the blood of Christ, and just say, I don't care, then I start to say, I don't think you know the Lord. Because I just don't see how that could be. Or maybe it's, maybe it's that we're just, we're on our own agendas, our personal agendas, and you know, I'm like that. You know, I get selfish and self-centered and, and forget what he's called me to do and wander off. What I'd like to do today is, is basically just to, to take a look at our failure and stop looking at all the other people and saying, you're attacking the church, you're attacking the church. I want to look at what we're doing personally. And, and I think our biggest failure is to, to not submit to God. You know, just to actually consider his word valid. Yes, he really said and, uh, you know, maybe there's some translation problems where we can work all those out and we get to the bottom we know this is his word and we actually just do it. Just submit to it and say, okay, God, you're a Lord. Um, I think this is really the biggest attack on the church of Jesus Christ. I think it's an inside job. I do. When I was uh, 16, I worked at a gas station and uh, it was my very first day. And uh, they told me how to work everything. It was like one of those little booths with glass and, you know, people poked the money in. And this I think there was credit cards back then, but mostly not, just put the money in. And uh, it would be you know, $29.95, and I'd turn on the pump for $29.95. Anyway, the guy who hired me says, okay, at 1 o'clock in the morning, what you got to do is you got to come out of the cell booth, put a wedge in the door, you got to spread the soap around on the, uh, on the bays there, and you spray them down with this hose, and then, and then you do these other things. Anyway, as I'm spraying the hose you know, around, all of a sudden, two guys with guns put them to my head. They said some really mean things to me. And they took me into the bathroom, one of them did, while the other one went in and robbed the place. And uh, I thought they were going to kill me. I, I really, really thought the guy was going to kill me because I was laying on the bathroom floor, which I had mops, so that was even double nasty. And, uh, and I said, just take the money. And he's like, and he cocked the gun and said, you know, blank, 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 and shut up. And I, I thought I was done. When it was all over, and uh, you know, the cops had come, and the, you know, the detectives did their thing, but they discovered that it was an inside job. The guy hired me specifically because I was 16 years old, right? I was hireable, but I wasn't worldly, right? 
I did live on my own. I've been on my own for some period of time, so I was kind of a homeless kid, right? And he hired me because I would do exactly what I was told, and then him and his buddies could come in and rob the place. So they left the safe open. You know, I don't know, it's just overwhelming when I realized that I had been suckered, you know? That the whole thing was a setup. It was an inside job. And the reason I give an illustration is because I think we don't realize we do that stuff. We work against ourselves. We work against Christ. And so this is, I'm calling this sermon, you know, love is mutual submission. Submission. And, and, you know, that word bothers people. So don't turn off. Okay? I want you to hear what this really means, I think, to God. And so, the, the other day I said this, and I can quote it. I'm going to quote it today. It's, it's 1 John 4, 8. It says, God is love. God is love. I should have a slide that says that. If I don't, Lindsay is totally fine. God is love. Um, does God submit? Does God submit? If you're shaking your head, no, you're wrong. Okay, does the Son submit to the Father? Yes, the Son submits to the Father. Is Jesus God? Yes, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're all God, three in one. They're immutable, right? But they submit. So this, the Son submits to the Father. The Spirit submits to the Son, yes? You think, is that true? Yes. I will send my counselor. I will send the counselor, the Spirit, Almighty God. So it submits. The Spirit of God submits to the Son of God and to the Father. Does the church submit to the Spirit? If it doesn't, it's not the church. Does the church of Jesus Christ submit to the Spirit? Because if it doesn't, it's not. Each member of the body submits to one another. Ephesians. Each member of the body submits to one another. If we're in a meeting and there's ten of us and nine of us want to build a fountain out front, one of them says, no, I don't want to build a fountain, you know, we might say, oh, you know, it's just a fountain or whatever. It's not, we submit to one another, right? We don't go against the word of God, but when it comes to just things that don't necessarily matter, we submit to one another, yes? Every one of us, and we should do that. And if we don't, then we're not doing God's work. Does society submit to the government? Romans 13, right? Am I right? That we, the, the sword is the government's business, and God gives the government the sword. What's that mean? It means if you break the law, you go to jail. Or you pay the fine. That's what it means. It's right in the scriptures. It says obey the laws. We submit to the government because the government, godless or otherwise, is an institution supported by God. I know it gets a little crazy, but I'm telling you, you can back it up with a word. You can back it up. And a godly husband submits to Christ, doesn't he? Yes, a godly husband submits to Christ. But here's where it stops off. I know, I know there's where it stops, okay? So ladies, don't turn me off, because the next verse when it says, when your wife submits her husband, like, stop that crap, we're not doing that. Like, listen, think about it for a minute. It's not saying what it necessarily seems like it's saying, and so, uh, do, do we all want our children to submit to our leadership, especially when we will? Okay, so I think it goes both ways, all right? So just bear me out. Here's a, here's a quote by Scott McKnight in a book, The Blue Fairy King which is kind of like rethinking how you read the Bible. Not necessarily sign up for much of what he says, but I, I do really like this. The fall of man, pardon me, turned the woman to seek to dominion over the man, or dominance over the man. And the fall turned the man to seek dominance over the woman. A life of struggling for control is the way of life for the fallen. I want to read this again, listen. The fall of man turned the woman to seek dominance over the man, and the fall turned the man to seek dominance over the woman. A life of struggling for control is the way of life for the fallen. Raise your hand if it's true in your marriage and your life. Liars. <laughs> it's true. It is true. We want control. But Scott and I continues. But the good news story of the God of the Bible, the scripture, the gospel, is that the fall eventually gives way to new creation. Okay? The fallen can be reborn and recreated. Sadly, the church has far too often perpetuated the fall as a permanent condition. Perpetuating the fall entails failing to restore creation conditions when it could be restored. What he's trying to say is, listen, we can be born again, yes? In Christ, we're new, right? 
Why do we have to keep living that same old struggle and doing what everybody else says? Well, I'm not going to submit. Stop! That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. The whole thing rests on submission all the way through. It does. The, the Son went to the cross in submission to the Father. He's in the garden of Gethsemane on his face, crying out and bleeding and just saying, Father, if it's possible, take this cup for me. And the Father said, it's not possible. Why? Because a hundred billion people who I want to redeem are requiring this blood, and this blood requires submission, so let them nail you down and hang you up. Submit to the Father. Are you with me? And so what I'm suggesting is that a lack of submission is actually far more dangerous to the church and to really any family than any other hell's tools. That's what I'm trying to say. Your neighbor could be homosexual. It's probably not going to affect your family a whole lot. But failing to submit to Christ's leadership and to each other in your home will destroy your home. It will destroy your family. And frankly, it's not very Christ-like. It just isn't. It's not Christ-like. It's not Christian to not submit to one another. Paul, Paul says it this way to the Philippians. Uh, 2, 6 through 11. Though he was God, Jesus, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God. Obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name of all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and in earth and under the earth, and every tongue should declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so we're so busy lifting ourselves up that God can never do it. And we can only lift ourselves up so far anyway, right? Christ, Jesus, the Messiah, didn't cling into heaven and say, I am king of kings. You know, he's like, I'll go over by submitting to the Father and proving it. And so make sure you get this again. I'll put it on screen. He took on the very nature of a servant. He humbled himself by becoming obedient, even unto death. And therefore, what I need to say is, and I want you to write it down, love equals submission. We say, I love you, then submit. If I love you, Lord, then I submit. If I love you, church, then I submit. It doesn't mean I'm going to lay down God's word and say, no, I'll just do whatever you think. That's not love. We all submit to Christ first, but we have to submit to each other the same. Just a few verses later, Paul writes to the Philippian church and he says, I need help. I need help. I'm abandoned, dude. And so he writes them a letter. He says, please send Timothy. Please send Timothy. I'm alone. I've been abandoned because everyone deserted me. Why? Why, Paul? Because they refused to submit to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They left me. They left me. And he says this, uh, Philippians 2.21, all the others care only for themselves and not for what matters to Jesus Christ. What? Yeah. They only cared about themselves, and so they left it. Probably the greatest apostle who ever lived, who's taken on the whole world and eventually will be crucified himself, they left him. Why? Because they only cared about themselves. This guy, Paul, and he nailed it. I mean, Holy Spirit moves through him. And when he speaks the words of God, you know, it just cuts you open. You're like, that's true. That's true. Well, he went on in his book in the Ephesians, he, he writes about spirit guided relationships, spirit guided relationships, and he goes into great detail about, about, you know, how husbands should be and how wives should be and how older men and younger men. He does this repeatedly in a lot of his letters. I want to read just a little bit of uh, Ephesians just for you. Uh, Ephesians 5.21. And further, he goes on with his thought, submit to one another out of what? Reverence for who? So we submit to one another. By the way, specifically, he's talking about husbands and wives. Husbands and wives. You submit to one another. So I know at one point he says, wives submit to your husbands. And, and, and yet here in the beginning of the letter, 521, he, not the beginning of the letter, but the beginning of this kind of like thought process. He says, you submit to one another. What does that mean? It means that, you know, you're equal in his eyes. 
Even though one technically, you know, is the head and one is the follower, you know, submit to one another. And so both the husband and the wife submit, and who do they submit to? Christ. They both submit to Christ. And so therefore, because they both submitted to Christ, then the one who actually reigns in their home is King Jesus. Because he's the one who sacrificially gave. He's the one who bought their souls. Okay, and so they both submit to him. And so control is not a question. Why? Because control has already been surrendered. We've already given control to Christ. Why do we need to fight anymore? And so then the husband and the wife have mutually given control over to Jesus Christ. And so, uh, write this down, both submission and love are based on the couple's relationship to Christ. Both submission and love are based on the couple's submission to Christ. And then, and then after he says that, he gets a little bit more detail. He says, Ephesians 5, 22, 24, For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Now, for a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of his body, Jesus is the head, Savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Okay, you're going to get a little shocked by this, you know, because you have to go back 50 years, which, by the way, I was like six, okay. But it wasn't even that long ago, and actually in churches right now, some of them in the Miami Valley, this is still done. In a church, a woman would not come to church without a hat. She would not come to church without a hat. You know I'm right, right? Um, one of my friends comes to church here occasionally, and she has a little door there in her head because there's a scripture, and I'm not saying come to church without a hat, I'm saying listen to this. The scripture says that a woman who prays with her head uncovered is kind of like acting out of authority. She's just not submitting. And, it, and it's like, what? What are you talking about? Paul and Paul says, and a man who, cover, who comes into the church and prays with his head, with his head covered is sinning because his head is covered. And so it's a picture that he's trying to give us. And here's the picture. I see all the women with their eyes like that. They're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Who's the head of the family? Christ. Who's the head of the home? You know, Christ. But ultimately he's saying, husband, I'm going to hold you accountable. And then he's saying, wife. And so the picture is, the man uncovers his head because there's, no, there's nothing between him and Christ. There's nothing between. There's no sin, no nothing. It's all there. And then the woman covers her head and said, I'm under the authority of Christ and my husband. Now, I know we don't do that anymore, but I hope you catch the picture. Now, what changed in the last 50 years? Any level of submission at all to anybody for any reason or anything? I won't do it. Stick <coughs> to hell with you. And I think what's happened is I don't think our families have gotten better. And I don't think our churches have gotten better. They've gotten maybe bigger sometimes, or they got a lot more shallow. Um, this is weird, you know, but just go with me for a minute. Um, I had a pastor talk to me one day and he made an analogy and when he did it, I was like, wow, that was really deep and kind of weird, but man, it was true. <laughs> and so what he says, he says, this is a picture that goes throughout the scriptures, that, that God wants us to do things a certain way. And he says, it's a picture in marriage as well. And Paul talks about it a little bit. He says, a woman... A woman, the creature that God created from the, from the river that she lays down her life, her will. She lays it down. And the husband, you know, kind of lays down his will life too because he goes and he, he leaves his mother and father and becomes united to his wife. How does he become united to her? Well, the two become one flesh. So as she lays down, as she will, she submits to his leadership. I said it was weird. <laughs> And then he's pushing forward as she's opening up. And I'm like, you got to stop this man. You're killing me. And he said, and then comes forth life. Wow. The church receives Christ. And in doing that, we lay down our will. And we lay down our, if you will, kind of what we want necessarily, and what happens is Christ comes in and there is life created for those death. There's something new happening, and God does that, and that is the gospel. That's how we're born again. 
And so Ephesians 5, 25 to 26, for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave his life for her to make her holy and clean, washing her washed by the cleansing of God's word. So it's saying, husbands, you need to die. You need to die for your family. You need to die for your wife. This is the way it's done. And if you want to be Christ-like, that's how you have to do it. And so it's not just her laying down her life, it's you laying down your will and you want sometimes. And then Ephesians 5, 27, he goes in anymore. He says, because he, Christ, did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any blemish. Instead, uh, she will be holy and without fault. Um, I think the greatest recipient, uh, I guess, of, of a family that... Uh, submits really kind of as the husband, I guess, if you will, you know, because he gets to, you know, have a family that loves him, but the truth is he's also the one with the biggest sacrifice. His mission is to die, you know, for her. And so it's this relationship that God puts together, and he says, this is how I want it to be, this is how I made it, and if you listen to him, he will be amazed. Ephesians 5, 28-33, in the same way husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we're all members of his body. As the scripture says, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. And this is a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. You get it? A man leaves, and the mother, father, Christ leaves heaven. I mean, it's all this amazing mystery, but it all happens when we submit every one of us to the public. And the result is a family. It's a family in your house, but it's a family in church, right? It's Christ's family. Let me read a little bit more about Scott McKnight. He says this, Perpetuating the fall entails failing to restore creation conditions when it comes to male and female relationships. When we perpetuate this whole, I won't do it, no, it ain't going to happen, you know, I'm going to try to get dominance over him, I'm going to try to get dominance over here, what you have is you have big old mess. And it doesn't get better. But we have hope. And that hope is in Christ. Paul wrote another letter. This one's to Titus. I want to read you just a few verses. Titus 2. As for you, Titus, his protege, promote this kind of teaching. Promote the kind of living that reflects wholesome teaching. Teach the older men to exercise self-control and to be worthy of respect and to live wisely. Older men. They must have sound faith and be filled with love and patience. Similarly, teach the younger women to live in a way that honors God. They must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. Instead, they should teach others what is good. These older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to live wisely and to be pure, to work in their homes. It doesn't mean you can't work outside your home, but to work in your home as well. To do good and to be submissive to their husbands. And then read this. Then they will not bring shame on the word of God. Flash Eve. Just flash Eve. In the same way, encourage the young men to live wisely. And you yourself must be an example to them by doing good works of every kind. Let everything you do reflect the integrity and the seriousness of your teaching. Teach the truth so that your teaching can't be criticized then those who oppose us will be ashamed and have nothing bad to say about us. Um, in the final analysis, I, I, I just, just go back to, to Genesis. Eve wanted to be her own God. She saw that the tree was pleasing to the eye. And, and that desire to be her own God overwhelmed her. She was deceived. We're not gods. Being your own God is a horrible disaster, I assure you. And then Adam failed to leave because he wanted to please Eve and himself. And he didn't want to please God. He just moved outside. And so now both of their eyes are open. And of course, we now have the fall. Uh, the good news is, is that we don't have to stay there. The good news is that as we submit to Christ, that he is 
faithful and he will come and he will change everything from the beginning to the end. And so we have to submit to him. And how do we do that? We have to stop battling for control. We have to stop refusing to submit. I'm not asking for lemmings. Christ isn't asking for lemmings. He said, just become who I created you to be. Why can't you do that? Because you won't stop being who you want to be. It's not your hopes and dreams for the future that matter. It's his hopes and dreams for the future. And you will, not one of us will escape this life unless Christ comes back. Not one of us will escape. We will not escape the grave. And, and so just stop. And so none of that stuff, that struggling and trying to get a head up and not giving a little bit here because he might run over me and vice versa. And none of that is loving God. None of it is loving other people. It just isn't. Now, you can write me letters if you want. But I'm just telling you that's it. I think most of you just want to love ourselves. And as a result, we don't get the love we could really get. Guys, you can come on up. Um, I know a sermon like this is weird, which is why I pick a Saturday or Sunday when there's not very many people here, so, you know. But um, if, I'm, if I'm telling you, if I'm speaking the truth, I don't want you to just delete it. Don't just say, Jim said submit, the heck with him. What I'm saying is if God said it, then take it and own it and make it you. Because he is the answer. And he always has been. <laughs> Come to me, Father, thank you for, for this word that you've given us. And thank you for the way it, I guess it just cuts away at, at you know, the sinful nature. Lord, help us to be who you called us to be. Help us to hear your voice. In Jesus' name.